Good morning, everybody. People are still coming in. Um, there are some people uh, still waiting to get online. So um, we'll start slowly with the introduction. Uh, my, my name is Peter van Ooyen. I'm the coordinator of the machine learning lab of the Data Science Center in Health, or DASH, of the UMCG. Um, I will be your moderator today. Um, I'm supported by Linda Weidelei, who has organized these uh, webinars. And this is our second webinar in the series that we do together with analysts. Um, to start, I want to show you a short introduction on, on what uh, DASH is about and what we do. Uh, DASH, the Data Science Center in Health, uh, is working to increase uh, the use and the application of data science uh, within the UMCG. Uh, we do that in different ways by uh, running projects, uh, by uh, trying to connect people, uh, by looking at education and needs assessment, um, and also the machine learning lab, for example. Um, Andre Capella is one of the people that came to us with a need, um, the need to have uh, educational opportunities for analysts to learn more about data science and how they could use it in their clinical practice. Uh, Andre is an analyst at the UMCG and uh, he would like to form a group of analysts uh, that are interested uh, in working with data science and AI. Um, during this um, webinar uh, you can ask questions if you want um, we'll keep the questions we'll save them up until the end of uh, each presentation so if there, are, if there are questions in between uh, either raise your hand you can do it by the little button in the bottom of your screen where you see that little uh, doll with the hand raised if you click that we see that you raised your hands and we'll give you the microphone to ask your question uh, if you do not want to use the microphone you can also type it in the chat box. You can open the chat box on the right side of your screen with the purple uh, button. Uh, there you have a general chat and everybody can read your question and we'll, uh, I will uh, pick up those questions and ask them to the, uh, to the presenters. Um, today we have three uh, presentations. Uh, the first one is uh, on examples of data science in practice and tips to get started by Dimitrius Sodis. Uh, then we will have a general introduction to digital pathology by Bert van Vecht, and then uh, the digital pathology, pathology in practice by Henk Buikema. Um, so we'll start with uh, the first presenter, uh, Dimitrius. Hi. And I'd like to give him uh, the floor and the opportunity to share his screen. So, Dimitrius, go ahead. Hi, good morning, and thank you for having me here. So, let me first reshare my screen and hopefully do that successfully. Uh, yes, so I will be pre presenting today. Uh, so, I will talk about data science in practice. And uh, my name is uh, Dimitrios Soudis. Uh, I work for the data science at the team at the CIT here in Ruch. And so I will start with a brief introduction, who I am and who my team is, very brief. And then I will give you two motivating uh, cases that are ongoing with the UMCG and my team. I, I work on both of these cases. The one is about DNA mutations uh, and, and sort of uh, creating a, a model that predicts if these mutations will be pathogenic, if the patient will get sick. And the other uh, model I'm working on now is about predictions uh, of antimicrobial consultations in the intensive care unit. Um, so after these sort of uh, examples, I will use them as motivation, so, so why it's nice to know uh, about data science and all these nice techniques. I will talk about how to get going with data science. So I will talk about software, hardware, and resources where you can sort of educate yourself. Uh, and then just to start who I am and, and why are you listening to me? So I came in Groningen in 2010 to do my PhD in economics. Uh, so uh, some people think that, you know, data scientists only come from computer science or something like that. It doesn't really matter if you if you have a, a nice understanding of numbers, you you can do it. So it's no no problem. 
So I did my PhD in economics. I worked as, as an assistant professor in economics in FEB, the Faculty of Economics and Business, up until 2018. And uh, after that, I moved to the data science team where I am today. And it's really nice being there. We have all these projects. We work with genomics, uh, medicine, computational linguistics, journalism, chemistry. I, I, you know, we do a lot of consultancy. We work with firms outside of the university, helping them to, to understand the data and extract value. So uh, it's, it's really nice. And I think you know, the, the idea of, of, of or, or I mean, the skills, once you become a data scientist, they are applicable into every, every domain. And, and this is the team. Uh, just so you know, I'm the guy in the middle with the uh, red and uh, black uh, shirt, checkers. Dimitri, yes. Dimitri, you, we don't see your slides advancing. Oh, you don't see my slides advancing? No, we just see your star slide. And the That's... full uh, GUI of your uh, application and not the. Uh... Okay, just wait a minute then. Uh... So, uh, what would be then a better way to to share this? Do you have an idea? Should I share the file then, or? Um, oh, when you did it earlier in the test, it did work. So I'm doing the same thing. Let me let me re re. Uh, uh, so uh, Lustrum. Uh, let me go for entire screen then to do it a bit differently. And then maybe, so mm, maybe this works? Yes, this works. OK, perfectly. great. So OK, so this is just the introduction, motivation of two examples, and then talk a little bit about resources, software, hardware. Uh, this is what I did, like I told you before, here, and who I am, and, and what I've done in Groningen so far. So I started from economics, uh, assistant professor, and now I'm a data scientist. And this is the team. I'm uh, this guy in the middle. I was having a very bad hair day that day, so don't, don't mind that. Uh, and this is the team. So we have backgrounds from uh, all around the university. From uh, So if I start from the right, this is Leslie. She came from mathematics, Christian from physics, Aria from computer science, uh, Andre from physics and all the way to statistics and, and lots of backgrounds. I have uh, here our, our uh, website link and uh, I will share this document later on if you want to explore more. You can just Google uh, data science at RUH CIT and it will come up. So every year we have a competition. If you need help with uh, a project, the next competition will start in uh, September. You can just uh, go online, see the instructions and apply. And you might get the help of a data scientist with your projects. So uh, for today, uh, I will start with the first uh, case study. Uh, so we, we were called from the genomics uh, department. And we were told that they work on, let's say, genetic mutations. So you know you've seen these pictures probably. So this is sort of the uh, DNA. And these are the bases, the C, G, T, A. And then, you know, you, you might see in the general population that at a certain point there is a C and a G basis, but then some people have a mutation. Instead of that, they have a T and an A, right? And so, so these people were, were trying to find out, uh, will this be harmful for the patient or not? Uh, and then uh, you should know that we uh, don't have anyone from genomics or, or we don't have the background for that, which is another cool thing with data science. You, uh, there was this really famous statistician, Tuki, and he said that uh, if you're a statistician, you can play in everyone's backyard. It's the same about data scientists. Uh, so we looked around and we found several existing tools, and they all had great limitations. So some of them only covered part of possible mutations. Uh, the others were not suitable for rare mutations, and the clinicians, they, they saw for... Uh, for some reason, some very weird rare mutations that, that existing models wouldn't cover. And the existing models also, existing tools, they had very high false positive rates, right? So if 80% if of the people who walk through the door are predicted as uh, having a pathogenic mutation, the doctors will always be busy. Uh, so the research aim was, uh, can we produce a tool that will classify people 
into two uh, cases. So the ones that are uh, indeed pathogenic and the ones that are not. And we wanted to cover as much of the genome, the human genome as possible. In fact, in the end of this project, the people used the model and they scored, I think, the, the, the whole thing. So it's available online. Uh, we wanted to be as accurate as possible. And, and the third thing uh, we wanted to do is, is based on widely uh, available lab measures, right? So we wanted what we do to be usable. So, so, so the idea, like uh, I say below in the methodology, is, was, was not really to, to create a new, let's say, machine that tests stuff or, or sort of do uh, primary basic uh, science. The idea was to, to combine high quality data sets and use routinely computed measures from blood samples and just think of a, of a different and more, let's say, creative way of combining them. And, and that way would be, in our case, machine learning. So we use the state-of-the-art machine learning algorithms like XGBoost, uh, which is uh, currently you know, probably the best thing that happened uh, in, in, in machine learning, uh, at least when you're working with, with tabular data, data that fits within a, a spreadsheet, an Excel. And so, so the idea here was that you have all these machines creating numbers every day, uh, that's great. Can we combine them in a different way? Can we extract some value that hasn't been already uh, extracted? And the results from this, uh, as I show you here, so this is sort of the results uh, that we had. So uh, these are different models. Uh, the first one is the one we created. The other ones are models that exist out there in the wild. Uh, this uh, y-axis, it measures the AUC score, and some of you might, might be familiar. Uh, what this measure does is basically it tells you the ability of, of your model to separate between let's say pathogenic and non-pathogenic and and the ability goes up to one meaning a hundred percent you're 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 able to separate those two at a hundred percent of the cases and these different dots are basically different types of mutations so if you look at our model is very 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 good it's, it's it's close to to being perfect for most mutations and, and really good in some others. And if you look at the existing models, they're, they're nowhere near, right? So, so the second most uh, valuable tool, CAD, it goes up to 0.8. So we're doing much better than them. This other tool, Revel, that would look to be really nice as well. It is really nice, but from what we hear, heard is that it's missing about 75% of mutations that people see in clinical practice. So while it's good, it has a very limited uh, use case. So, so the, what I'm trying to say is that the reason why we did really well was not so much that we created something unprecedented. It's just we thought a little bit more creatively. We said, you have all this available information. Can we use it uh, in a different way? And you know, the answer was, in this case, machine learning. And, and the cool thing about this is that now there is a free tool let me see. This will probably work. Yes. So you see it's online. You can choose a file, upload it uh, with your own sort of uh, blood exams uh, results coming out. The model is actually CAPIS is short for Consequence Agnostic Pathogenicity Interpretation of Clinical Exome Variations. I, don't, I can't say that really. So, And I don't even know what half of these things mean which is another cool thing. Uh, so you just need to understand the data, not so much. You know, that's why it's really nice to, to have cooperations between experts in that field and the data scientist, because you understand different parts of the problem. So let me go back into the uh, presentation now. Uh, yes. Why is this not happening? Oh, that's bad. I'm okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> somehow, know. yeah. Somehow I was kicked out. Hi. Somehow I was kicked out. <laughs> okay. I'm oh, back, back now. Yes. Okay. So let me share the whole screen again. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, and then let's go back. So somehow it just it just uh, it's not allowing me. Okay. It's back here. Oh, don't do that again. Uh, share screen. I'm not sure what's happening. Mm. 
let me stop sharing the screen and then reshare it. I think this will fix it. Uh, screen allow and this I think will fix it. Slideshow. It's not allowing me to go further. I'm not sure why this is happening. Uh, any ideas? No, I don't want to raise my hand. Uh, this is really strange. Close the browser, then I will have to... That's a good suggestion, but... Uh, okay, let me go in and out again a little bit fast. Uh, let me... Are you going to log out completely? Yes, uh, console, so where, where is the login out part now? Uh, da, 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 da. How do I leave this from here, probably, right? On the top left, we have that session menu, yeah. He's out. Okay, well, I hope he will be back soon, so he can continue on his presentation. He's coming back again. And he is moderator again, so he should be available again. Dimitrius, are you there already? And he's but this again. thing is, is persisting. Uh, this problem is persisting. Uh, let me try to. Why did this happen? Uh, share screen. Are you sharing this? Okay. Sharing the screen. Yeah. Yes. Uh, let me then just share not the screen but only the slides. Do you see it now? Yes. Great. And is it moving? Yes. Great. Okay. So so second case case study. So as you might know, occasionally uh, the patients in the intensive care unit they will develop some infections. And doctors, they often seek the advice of clinical microbiologists. It's a team that stands by, basically, and they're waiting for to be called by a doctor to, to manage uh, the uh, infections of, of a certain patient because, you know, it's really difficult to, to find out uh, what kind of infection they have if this particular infection in this particular patient, it's uh, antibiotic resistant or not. And, you know, being the doctor that... Uh, looks around for I don't know, 30, 50 people and at the same time does all this analysis is a bit uh, difficult. So so these people help doctors uh, manage the infections. And then uh, they, they came to us with a question, can we predict when the call will take place? When will a doctor uh, be putting a call on us for a certain patient? And uh, so the idea here is imagine if we are, uh, we have data for, for a patient from Monday and we have split the day in eight hour intervals. So you go from 12 in the night until eight in the morning, eight in the morning until four in the afternoon, and four in the afternoon until 12 in the night. Can we predict the next shift? Let's say Thursday at uh, 12 o'clock in the night, will something happen then? Can we predict if, if so basically, you know, get, get some data from the past and predict one shift in advance if this team will get a call from the doctors? Uh, and, and, you know, so, so this is a picture from a patient in, in the ICU. It's not from Groningen. Uh, it's just a random uh, picture. It's, in fact, it's not even a patient. It's a dummy uh, on the bed. But what I wanted to show you with this picture is that, is that uh, where, where other people, you know, see only a patient in, in a bed, uh, these people saw data. And if you look at the red circles, uh, these patients are... are they're they're wired, let's say, uh, and they have you know they their their heart rate is monitored, their breathing uh, rate is monitored, uh, blood pressure. Um, they also have IVs, right? So they have catheters. They have so many stuff on them, and all of this is data. So the idea is, and this data they're they're routinely uh, collected. Every let's say uh, few minutes, there's another data point for every patient. So, so the question was, can we use this data as they come in 
uh, real time and then make a prediction like, you know, patient number 13 uh, in eight hours from now, you will probably get a call about this patient. So, of course, we're not yet at the real-time phase. We're, we're just building the, the prototype. And, and so we, we used this data. It's still ongoing, uh, so I don't want to say too much about it. But we are currently reaching an, an AUC of 0.93. Uh, an AUC, I told you before, it goes up to 1. So we're doing very well. Uh, we're doing well because we're using sort of a, another state-of-the-art model there. It's, it's a deep learning model called LM a long short-term memory uh, neural network. It's very nice when you have sequence data, so when you have time series, for example, like the ones we have for these patients. And, and the long-run aims of this project is to prioritize patients in a way that, you know, limited resources are efficiently used, right? So in an ideal world, uh, we would all have our personal doctor and our personal uh, clinical microbiologist just standing next to us, this is impossible. So, so what we hope to do with this model is rank patients according to the needs for consultation. And then when you know I have only, for example, let's say three doctors, I'm going to send them to the three more likely patients. So ideally, uh, we can help the doctors uh, use resources more efficiently. Uh, and now I'm sort of done with, with the uh, case studies. And, uh, oh, by the way, yes, uh, I'm done with the case studies, and I want to talk to you about, so, okay, how do I make a transition into data science? And it's uh, certainly something you can you can easily do because I'm talking to analysts right now, right? I'm not talking to, you know, let's say, well, I know historians that do data science, but uh, it took uh, more effort for a historian to become a data scientist than it will take for you. So so let's start with hardware. My my uh, advice would be just to be pragmatic, you know, and, and, and uh, so my laptop, the one I'm using for, for all these project, uh, projects, has 16 gigabytes of RAM. It has four cores and it has an, an NVIDIA graphics card. So it's, it's nothing fancy. I think I bought it for 1,200 or 1,400 euros. So, and this already can handle hundreds of thousands of rows with hundreds of columns. So... Uh, you don't need to go overboard and, and buy yourself a small server. Uh, a nice laptop, let's say with 1,500 euros, it's going to do great stuff. And at the end of the day, if you need more, uh, the right way to go would not be to buy a bigger laptop. It would be to use Peregrine. Or, or, or you know, if you're part of a team and you see that you guys are doing a lot of data science, you can come together as a, deem, a team and buy a, a small server for you. So we bought one as a data science team about seven or eight thousand euros and it is amazing it has 40 cores it has two graphic cards we are having fun with that so for you as a person though i want to get started i think your laptop already if it has 16 gigabytes of ram um, it's already i think the best uh, the the minimum i would say you you can do a lot with just that laptop uh, so so don't care too much about hardware uh about software you know we use uh, either python or r some people use MATLAB, uh, that's fine. Uh, some people, uh, there's a new language coming up, it's called Julia. It's not yet so widespread, but but so so I would say about 90 something percent of the cases, it's about choosing between R and Python. And I think this is like always, the, if, if you look in the internet, there's the war between Python and R, which one should I start with? Which one should I learn? I would like to say that in the end, it's nice if you know both of them. But if you have to pick just one to get started, which one? So I will try to, to, to tell you, you know, how I would choose if I was starting from the beginning again. So if you look just out there, uh, you look at popularity. So if you look at Google Trends, R versus Python for data science, you will see that Python after 2016 has taken over. And R is, is kind of stable, right? This doesn't mean necessarily that Python is, 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 is fantastic and R is not. Uh, what it really means is that uh, people from computer science and engineering moved into data science and they already knew Python. So it looks like Python is taking over, but uh, it's, it's, it's really a shift in, in who is doing that work. So back in the days, that work was done by statisticians mostly. But now that computer scientists and, and engineers are coming in, they're also bringing Python with them. Uh, also the same if you look for R versus Python for machine learning, you will see that, that Python has, has skyrocketed. And it's true that uh, machine learning is a bit uh, more seamless in, in, in Python than it is in R. Uh, so 
these are just in terms of, of trends. Python seems to be the, the best option. Uh, but uh, let's let's talk a little bit about the two languages. So so if you look at Python, what's what's best about Python is that it is a general programming language. So you don't only use it to to do data science. You can use it to create a website or or some other application that it will be running somewhere. It's it's much much easier general programming in Python than it is in R. Another pro is that it's it's awesome for machine learning and deep learning, computer vision. It's just really, really uh, developed the ecosystem. And that's because Python was already there. And there, like I said, computer scientists and, and, and engineers started working a lot with data. So they had a great uh, programming language, and they used it in a very efficient way to create really good code to do that. Uh, now, some of the, the uh, drawbacks is that, OK, if you like Windows, you know, I, when I started with data science, I was using R and, and Windows was, was fine. Then when I moved to Python, I saw that Windows was a big hindrance, so I, I moved to Linux. So uh, Windows might be in the way, and you might need to invest a little bit in Linux and, and general you know, computer science literacy, but not too much, a little bit. And another you know, drawback for me is that statistics, plain statistics like, like regression and, and you know, distributions and t-tests, they're quite painful in Python for me, at least. Uh, because in R, they're native. In Python, you, you have to import a lot of libraries. It's, it's, it's a bit, you have to learn the Python way of doing statistics. But R is kind of, you know, uh, very simple to do statistics. So on the other hand, R, the pros, like I said, statistics is great. It's native. That's why it was created. It was created by statisticians, not computer scientists. Uh, and this is also a drawback <laughs> because it's not a general programming language. Another pro is that you can be an effective analyst within one to three months. So for me, if I would you know, want to do things right in Python, I would spend some time to learn basic computer science skills. In R, you don't need to do. You can circumvent that and just go straight into the data. And, and you can be faster doing stuff. But I will talk about it the, uh, a bit more uh, later about this. So, so the cons is that it, R is not a general programming language. You can do stuff. You can, you, know, you can create classes. You can create objects and stuff. But it's a bit more painful than, well, it's a lot more painful than Python, Python to do general programming. And, and another con is that machine learning is slower, and deep learning and computer vision is not as advanced. So I think it becomes clear that that you know Python is great for programming and 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 machine learning, deep learning, all of that. R is great for for working with tabular data, data that you can fit in a, in a spreadsheet, and and sort of clean them, analyze them, and do some statistics. Then that's where R shines. That's the use case of R. And then and then here's a simple sort of algorithm for you to choose. So if your data are unstructured, if you're using images, sound, and a lot of text. That I would go for Python. Again, this is all my uh, the way I feel about it. Uh, else, if you're planning to do mostly machine learning and programming, go for Python. And and finally, if you're working with structured data, like in a spreadsheet, and you want to do statistics and analysis, go for R. And uh, finally, some resources. I'll go fast through that. I will share this uh, document so you can read it. Okay, if you go for Python, here are a few books. Uh, for Python, I would start with this book, which is available online. It's called Think Python, second edition. It's free online. You can just read it. And then you must read the other two books, uh, well, one of them at least, either Python Data Science Handbook, which is freely available, or Python for Data Analysis by Wes McKinley. He's the guy who created Pandas, so he's really big in Python. And finally, I have all sorts of books here about machine learning and deep learning in Python. Um, any of the machine learning books will do fine. And the deep learning book, if you're planning to go into deep learning, you should go into that. So like I said, I will share this document so you can, or you can take a screenshot, I guess. And uh, then when it comes to uh, R, there is a book called R for Data Science. It's freely available. Just this book will get you all the skills you need to work on tabular data. And then my two favorite machine learning books, Applied Predictive Modeling and Feature Engineering and Selection. They're really great books. And even if you choose Python, I would certainly uh, advise you to read these books as well, uh, if you like machine learning. There's also a deep learning with R book. And I think this is my final slides. If you, at some point, want to become more proficient in machine learning, there are two more books. They're a bit more mathematical. 
So in introduction to statistical learning, not so much, but elements of statistical learning, I mean, if, if, you're, if you don't dream in linear algebra, don't even try it. Uh, and then finally, online resources, I would go for DataCamp. And uh, certainly, it's, it's, the courses are very simple, but at least it gives you a starting point. Coursera is another one I would go for, and then Udacity and EDX. And there's all sorts of courses there for, for machine learning, data science, cleaning data, importing data, and all of that. So I think that's me, and thank you for listening, and I guess I will hear about uh, your questions later. Thank you, Dimitrius. Um, yes. yeah, if we have, uh, because of the technical problems, we're a little bit behind uh, on schedule. Yeah. Um, but there is one question that you might want to ask that was in the chat, and it is, why is Windows a pain for Python? Uh, Windows is, 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 is a pain, wait a minute, I will just uh, stop my camera. So, so Windows is a bit of a pain for Python because uh, of a lot of the uh, uh, package conflicts and management. So I remember when I was in, like if, if you're using Linux, these things just, they just drop from a, reposit, uh, a, a uh, repository and, and you're fine. And then I remember in Windows there was a lot of, uh, conflicts, and then I was trying to to update one package, and then the other one wouldn't, and then there was this oh, and then you have to downgrade that one, and I, you know, I I found that that in in uh, in Linux these things are almost uh, almost automatic. I mean Python in general, uh, at least when compared to R, uh, Python package management is quite a pain. So if you use if you, if you choose to go for Python, look at distributors like uh, Conda. And actually, if you read any of the books like uh, the uh, Data Science Handbook with Python or the Python for Data Science from Wes McKins, uh, McKinley, uh, you will see that uh, they both uh, suggest that you go for Conda, which is a, a, a package distribution. And that might actually be okay on Windows. So I haven't tried that on Windows. Yeah. Um, there are two uh, remarks. Um, uh, one is from uh, from Fons who says, if you want to learn Python, he also has a good suggestion, uh, pi4.com uh, as a website to start with. Uh, yeah. Hmm. Manfred mentions that he missed a uh, the importance of a good database management system. Or oh, that's, database. that's yeah, I would say Manfred is, is correct here. It's just that at least in, in our practice, I mean, he... He's totally correct because if you need data, <laughs> you need to have a, a system there collecting, managing, and, and making sure the integrity of the data is, is, is good. But yeah. for us, where we work right now, people just dump their data on us. So this is yeah. kind of like their problem where we work. Yeah, you make yeah. your own. And, and about the virtual yeah. environment for Python, yeah, you're correct. I see, Rene, uh, you can run a virtual environment for Python, but it's like, I think Linux, like in general, if you want to be in data science, switching to Linux is highly recommended, super highly recommended. Because now, you, you do yeah. the VM with Linux and then. Yeah, so sure, sure, certainly, yeah. So there are different possibilities to solve that. I think we should move on to the yeah. next, because Beth from the West and Hank Buikema also want to share their, um, their knowledge about uh, pathology. Uh, Bert van der Vecht, the pathologist, and Henk Huikema, a digital technician, and they both will uh, give a presentation uh, with respect to pathology. So we're looking at imaging then. So we start with Bert. Bert, the floor is yours. Yeah, good You're morning, right? uh, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for the introduction, uh, Peter. Thank you to Andre for inviting us to uh, talk to you this morning about data science in pathology. Uh, I will start off with giving a brief introduction on the on the subject, and from there on, uh, Hank will take over from me uh, for a more practical uh, insight in in how are we doing things. And the first question you might ask yourself is why would pathologists need data science? Because ever since the dark ages of pathology, uh, this is what we've been doing. So we've been looking through microscopes and giving names to things and, and diseases and uh, so what we mostly do in, in daily practices is deciding if something is cancer or not and looking at, at, at types of cancer and we've always been doing that in a, in a very descriptive way uh, but things have changed so we've 
gained over the years more knowledge um, uh, on on cancer and also on other diseases, and we uh, have gotten more possibilities to treat patients. So uh, we're looking at patient tailored treatments these days, and and surgeons try to spare organs as much as possible. Radiotherapists. Uh, uh, try to give as small radiotherapy fields as possible. Uh, there are many different types of chemotherapy that, that are an option for a, uh, a cancer patient. We're looking at targeted treatments and there's immunotherapy and there's a lot of things coming in the next few years. And that has also had impact on, on pathology because uh, many of the decisions that uh, are made on which treatment a patient uh, uh, will get uh, are based on uh, uh, data from pathology reports. Um, and since back in the day, there weren't much possibilities for treatment, so we didn't just a description of how uh, a tumor or how a disease looked was, was fine enough, but you see that there is a shift towards more data-driven pathology. Uh, and that's something which we weren't that good in as, as pathologists. So uh, you see that there is a shift from subjective, just say, describing what you see, to objective pathology, uh, where we uh, give uh, numbers and, and we work with things like grading and measurement for tumor size and and we give resection margins in all, all directions. Uh, and more and more, uh, we have uh, predictive and prognostic markers that we uh, uh, look at in, in, uh, on, on tissue and cell uh, level. Uh, and those markers uh, have influence on the way we treat patients. Uh, but we have now come to a point where the information that we want to extract uh, from from the, the tissue and and the, uh, uh, and the stainings that we look at uh, is is so complicated that it's it's really hard for us as pathologists to look at it with the naked eye and, and to make decisions. Um, so uh, we need help. And, uh, and you could say, well, we've been having computers for years and years, so why didn't you think about using computers for these kinds of problems earlier? Uh, well, what we needed is slide scanners, so we uh, have those these days. Uh, and, and we do need a lot of computing power. So uh, one digital slide, uh, so that's one glass slide that we look, uh, used to look at uh, through, uh, through a microscope at. Uh, is one uh, is two and a half gigabytes, um, and uh, only in the UMCG we we look at 250,000 slides on a yearly basis. So that generates a half a petabyte of data per year, uh, and and we will see that uh, because these files are that big. If you want to develop an algorithm, you do need some uh, uh, high GPU power to be able to develop such algorithms. So Hank will tell you more about how we do this, but I just want to give you a, a brief overview of, of where we are now. And so uh, using simple machine learning algorithms, we have been able to, uh, to create some algorithms that solve some of the practical, practical problems that we have been having uh, already in clinical practice. So we have been able to implement a few of the algorithms which Hank will describe in more detail. And those are based on morphometry and on digital overlays. Uh, but what's next? Uh, uh, because if you want to make a really nice algorithm and we want to use deep learning for that, we need lots of data. So we are currently setting up a regional image repository and cell and tissue based image analysis facility where we use. Uh, where well, we hope to use data, so image data from all of the pathology uh, departments in uh, in the northern region, uh, and uh, we hope to use uh, to combine that data. And using that, we hope to create algorithms in future, uh, which will then again serve pathology diagnostics for the whole northern region. 
for that, we have been selected as a, as a DES frontrunner project because I'm a pathologist and Hank is used to be uh, a cytology technician, but these days is, is a, a, a digital technician. Uh, 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 but we're not data science experts, so the, the talk we just heard, it's, it's, it's not something that I understand, so I needed help. Uh, we are trying to collaborate on, on this project with the machine learning lab, uh, and, and together we hope to solve, uh, solve this problem in pathology. So, as I said, we've been having these, uh, these initial algorithms, which are, are based on, uh, on machine learning, so we tell the computer uh, what the the, uh, the parameters are uh, to make a difference between uh, what we call positive, or for instance, and what we call negative. So we define the classes, uh, but we hope to uh, move into uh, uh, deep learning algorithms where we just give the computer outcomes and we want it to train itself uh, on, uh, on, on how it should recognize these different classes. And for that, uh, we've received the UMCG Cancer Research Fund grant uh, at the start of this year, and that uh, allowed us to acquire uh, a, a deep learning uh, a module uh, to complement uh, the system that we already use. And uh, I think Hank will also uh, explain that in more detail. So and what's next? Well, this also gives us opportunities because uh, this allows us to get extra information out of of the the uh, of the images that we have. So uh, computers are are able to look into it in more detail and are also able to look at it uh, at at a level uh, and at an extraction level that that we just simply can't. So if you look at the at the top right side of the uh, of the slide that I'm showing you uh, is, is that you see that uh, an algorithm is able to recognize inflammatory cells between uh, 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 tumor cells uh, and it's able to recognize certain patterns in these inflammatory cells and that's something you just as, as a human we can't see that and we're certainly not able to to make a classification based on that. Uh, but computers are able to do that, and you can make an algorithm that's able to recognize this and, and build a classification on this. So it's not only that it helps us uh, uh, replace tasks, but it's, it's also a, a, a data science in pathology will help us to fine tune existing classifications uh, and develop uh, these new classifications. So that's it from me, and, and now Hank is going to show you how we do this in, in practice. Yeah, so we switch to Hank Bukma. Okay, I think at first we must share the screen. Yeah, I bet you'd stop sharing first. And then yeah, I, sh I stopped. So wait a moment. Can you see everything? Yes. My 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 first picture. Yes. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Um, at first, I will thank uh, uh, the Dash team for inviting me to tell something about digital pathology. I start with a small uh, intro introduction. So I think ten years uh, ago. Uh, nobody believed that digital screening and analyzing was normal in pathology. Uh, at the moment, my work was on, uh, on the cytology department as a cytotechnician. But uh, two years ago, I switched. And now I am a DT, a, a digital technician, without any IT experience. So I know something from about cytology, but from IT, I have no experience. And now at this moment, we do a lot of uh, digital screening and analyzing in the department. Um, so now the first, the first picture, and in this picture, you see a lot of information. At first, 
maybe you can see the arrow. Uh, my name, uh, Henk Buikema, and what tells the picture more that I'm working in the hospital, but I'm also working with uh, a few companies, so Philips, for uh, scanning the specimens in a visual farm for diagnostics and research and also artificial intelligence. Uh, QPath over here is uh, only for research and my company is also only for research. What we are doing in, uh, in the hospital for diagnostics is the key 67 and her tool on breast carcinomas, the key 67 and neuroendocrine tumors, ERPR and breast carcinomas, and soon we will start with metastasis from head and neck, colon, breast, and we do tumor detection from prostate biopsies. Also, so, Oh, that's too fast. In the research, we do. Uh, we have a, a, a very big program. Uh, there are a lot of researchers in the hospital. They are uh, come to me and ask, "Hey, can you do something for me?" Uh, for example, we do the Sjögren, but also the connection between smooth muscle and airways and lung. It's very popular at this moment, and we work also with tissue microarray. I give you an example uh, in, at first in diagnostics. Uh, we're starting at the histology department. They make specimens uh, from, for example, breast uh, tissue. And what uh, the pathologist will know is how many key 67 positive cells are in a tumor and how we are going to do this. Uh, we do this with virtual double staining. What do we need? We need uh, some scans from specimens. This is an H and E uh, staining, and the H and E we need for look if there is is, is tumor, but also we need a cytokeratin and also a key 67. From these three specimens, we make scans. And these scans, we are downloaded in a program, and the program uh, is from Physiofarm. Uh, Physiofarm is a company in Denmark, and they make, at this moment, the, the, the apps for us, the apps that are the algorithm, but it's also possible to make our own apps uh, because we get the author mo module. Now, how many apps uh, they have in, in, uh, in Denmark? Uh, you can see there's a lot. My screen is not, uh, not big enough to let you see all the apps, but what we are uh, using is, when you can see the arrow, is the, uh, I think at this moment, five to six to six apps. Oh, it's very fast now. I tell you some more about uh, the key 67. It's uh, about the proliferation index, and that's prognostic or predictive. Uh, a few years ago, they count the cells manual, but it's 500 to 2,000 cells, and that's uh, very time spending, but also not re reproducing. So we, do, we did a digital uh, image analysis on the key 67. Need two uh, algorithms, uh, one for a nuclei uh, classification and one from tumor or stroma detection. The tumor and stroma detection, we have three uh, op options to draw the tumor by hand or making a classifier. When you are making a classifier, you must uh, train the computer that they recognized the tumor cells, or we use uh, virtual double staining. Uh, in the department, we are using the uh, virtual double staining.
because that's the easy, easiest way uh, to get the results. What is a video double staining? Uh, I let you see this in an uh, animation. I hope it's working, but I tell you uh, what you see. In this picture, you see over here the tumor cells. This is stroma, and these are the positive key 67 cells. How did I know that these are tumor cells? Because I use a marker, uh, cytokeratin. This is the cytokeratin, and you see the overlay is perfect with the key 67 uh, marker. How do we know what tumor cells are? Okay, with the cytokeratin marker, and the program knows at this moment what tumor is and what stroma is. And, and they counting the key 67 positive cells and the tumor. You can see the negative tumor cells are blue and the positive key 67 are yellow. The results from everything is over here and you can see uh, also the tumor over here. This is the blue line over here it is the first algorithm and second is the key, 60, uh, key 67 app. It's positive red and negative blue and this is the cytokeratin. Is it also possible to work with TMAs? Uh, TMAs are small specimens from different uh, patients, so you can uh, you can do a lot uh, a lot of, of of tissue on on one slide, and then uh, then you can do the markers, and it 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 is possible. I give you an example from one. Uh, one core from a TMA and it's from the HER2, HER2 app. HER2 app is a membrane staining because you can see the lines from the positive cells. Okay, I think these are the diagnostics. Now I do also some research work. Uh, there are a lot of researches in, uh, in our hospital and they have also a lot of uh, of problems, uh, for insta instance, counting positive cells in a specimen, or what is tumor, and so you can. Uh, there are a lot of things they don't they don't know. The question is always, can we do it digital? Because it's easy, and uh, when you are counting manual, it's uh, a lot of time spending. Um, that's possible. It's always possible, I think, but the problem is there's no, no app or no algorithm, so you must make uh, something. Um, and I can do it in, in, in with the programs of QPath and also in, in, in VisioFarm. Uh, QPath is an open source program, so you can download the program from internet. Uh, with this program, you can make the algorithms and also the classifiers by yourself. Uh, VisioFarm is the same, but it's not an open source program. And that's also for my, my company. I'll give you an, uh, an example in, uh, in QPath and what you can do in QPath um, when you are looking to the picture. Um, that there are a lot of tools. You can use a lot, a lot of tools, and also the annotations. You can stroma over here, tumor over here, and you can do it by by hand. Um, the tools are are here. Uh, also the TMA, uh, the measurements. You can the auto, uh, you can automate uh, everything, but also analyzing. Then you must make a classifier. We are making a classifier. You can can open this this tool, and you can build and apply on your own app. 
uh, what yeah important at this moment is 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 yeah the intensity of the of the staining but also threshold uh, but you can can yeah use this button to go to the right etc 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 to build a very a very nice a very nice app Okay, is that also possible with TMAs? Yeah, I told you that it's also possible in TMAs, but at first uh, you saw a key 67 uh, with Fissure Farm. This is the key 67 in QPath. This is not a double staining. So uh, I must uh, annotate all the cells, uh, but also the stroma, etc., etc. And there are the results, and I think I think this app is not bad because these are all tumor cells. This is stroma and the red one that are all key 67 uh, positive positive cells. And it's also this TMAs, so you can do a lot on one slide. These are the results from the TMAs, so it's very very easy to do. Okay, do we also something with artificial uh, intelligence? Now, for me, is artificial intelligence, intelligence learn the computer by input from a lot of different pictures uh, from the same object um, and practice. Uh, it's for instance, for tumor detection, you need only an HME and you need a program with deep learning and the deep learning in Visual Farm is also with Python. Uh, it's only clicking, clicking on deep learning and then training uh, the the program uh, at first in Bird. Bird has a very nice any, uh, animation, but I do everything by hand. So draw. The tumor cells and draw stroma. Do do that again and again and again. Train the co the computer, and uh, at the end uh, he recognized the computer recognized every tumor cells. I know this is a very uh, very simple explanation, but it's also very easy to work with it. And I think in the next two years, we do everything with artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, thank you for listening. And there is a time for some questions. Yeah, thank you. We've got a couple of minutes left until 11 o'clock for questions. Uh, I, have I, I know. I have one question in the chat already. Uh, can you run image text through these programs? It's text. Um, together. Sorry, sorry. An image yeah, stack. So let, let, let me respond here. Yeah, okay. you can run uh, stacks of images. So if you if you make uh, so the, the first thing is that you need to develop an algorithm, and once you've you've got uh, a validated algorithm, then it's possible to uh, run this uh, on stacks. And uh, there's another question. Uh, how long does it take for the program to be trained to recognize a tumor correctly? Uh, with artificial in intelligence, uh, uh, I think a few days because uh, you must train and train and train uh, again. But for uh, for making a, a, a program, it's only uh, for at this moment for me when it's not too difficult, it's two hours. So the, the main work is in the, the all the annotations that you have to do to yes. the train. And yes. then the actual building of the model is not that the training of the model is not that long anymore. No, 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 no. It's 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 not long. No, it's and it's kind of dependent on, on which technique you use. So if yeah. you if you make us uh, an image uh, so a machine learning algorithm where you define your own uh, 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 limits then then it's it's just the time you put into making an algorithm and, and adjusting that algorithm uh, if you uh, 
want to make an uh, an AI based algorithm, then you and then you, you need to annotate lots of data, and there it is. The more data you have, the more you annotate, the more robust your algorithm uh, becomes. So, uh, and that takes more time because all the all the data needs to be trained. So that takes longer. Uh, um, uh, to 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 train it and and then again it's it's all dependent on on what's the question you ask and how complicated is that question and the more complicated your question is the larger the amount of data that you need to uh, uh, to get a, a robust algorithm. Yeah, and if we link that to the, the presentation by the videos, um, can you run this on your own computer because this is uh, not just an excel sheet but it's very large images so can you run that on your laptop or on your standard computer that crew path for example um so I, yeah cupa i think is running and well maybe hank should should explain um i'm yeah with the COVID 19 i'm working at home but uh it's only a login on my computer in uh, in the hospital and i can do can do everything and that's a standard UMCG computer. Yes, yes, an old one. I think uh, 2017. So <laughs> it's it's, pos it's possible. Yeah, okay. but that, that's that's the machine learning part. So for the yeah. deep learning, that's a different discussion because there you need the computing power and the GPU just to train the algorithm. So yeah. uh, that's why we need uh, that's why we we've gotten that additional module and and that needs to run uh, on, a, on a gpu cluster or at least on a on a powerful gpu to get some uh, some performance yeah okay thank you very much um i don't see any questions anymore in the uh, in the chat nobody is raising their hands so if there is a final question please put it in uh, uh, I see one final question, if Dimitrius can share the resources slides. Um, yeah, we can share the slides and also this whole meeting has been recorded. So we will also have this webinar online at the DASH uh, YouTube channel, uh, where you can review uh, the whole presentations and also look at the slides again. So we can I, share. I, just to say, I think I, 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 think I shared it. Uh, so. Because it's there in the uh, I shared it. I can see it has shared the whole my whole uh, my every slide. So probably it's in there. Uh, you uploaded it to the yeah okay, but I I don't think that that. Uh, uh, but but yeah. But Linda Linda says she will yeah she will share it. So Linda, by the way, will uh, make yeah. sure. That so that. thanks, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And um, thank you everybody for uh, attending. Uh, I think we had a very nice overview of what is possible uh, with a more general introduction and a, uh, a more in-depth on the pathology. I uh, hope to see you all next time. We're working hard to plan the next webinars of DASH and uh, we hope to get this good attendance uh, continuously because uh, we're worried about 60 to 70 people attending uh, today it's a very good uh, attendance i think so thank you all for being here thank you the presenters for giving their presentations thank you linda for uh, helping with all the uh, setup and the, the technical things that had to be arranged um if you want to if you're an analyst and you want to stay uh, up to date on activities on ai then you can send an email to this email address that's now on the screen ai.analyston at lc.umcg.nl and you will be added into the mailing list. So once again, thank you all and see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.